through a series of circumstances, a hard story to tell, what we've done. And they get together with the butler. And again, through a series of circumstances, they wreck us at the commodities exchange. At the end of the day, you have to pay up what you've lost. And we've lost $396 million in one day, and supposed to have it in cash. So they um, lug Don out, uh, carry him out, and I go out on a stretcher. We're broke, and, and they end up on, a, on a, a tropical island with girls and drinks and everything. And that's what they're shooting down there now. Let's move you over. Going down to say Eric, you find it's a hard story to tell? It's a very hard story yeah. to tell. It, it just doesn't synopsize there. well in a few sentences. Yeah. I've had a very tough time talking about you, the press. Yeah, I hate to have anybody say, what's it about? It's, uh, I'm not going to ask that question. <laughs> but, I, but I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's a unique... Yeah, it's story. screwy, it's, it's funny, never... it's wildly, wildly, ridiculously uh, funny. We think. <laughs> it has sort of a Preston Sturgis feel to it. But it's someone, someone who suddenly is thrown into the lap of wealth. Mm -hmm. Someone who's, who's utterly indigent. I'm going to have to move you over. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it has a real screwball uh, comedy kind of sound to it. Not quite screwball, but, but, but just a uh, uh, like late 30s Preston Sturgis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Great. Okay. Thank you. And John. <coughs> MJ. Training places. Uh, you like first name? John. I call you Ralph. John. Can I call you Ralph? Okay. Great. Yeah, you call me Ralph. I saw Eddie this morning on the Today Show. Yeah, we were watching it too. Did you see it? Yeah, with Joe Piscopo, yeah. 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 Didn't come off very well. I think they cut it. That they was tape, edited it. Wasn't it? Hmm? Wasn't that tape? Could I guess so. Because uh, he didn't mention uh, trading places, and uh, it seemed to be something that had been done some, some time ago. Did you see him on the Grammy Awards? Huh? Did you see Eddie on the Grammy Awards? No, I hear he was very funny. Oh, very he funny. Was. He made the show. Yeah. He's a yeah. funny man. Came out and grabbed the award yeah. from, from the fellow who won it. <clears throat> Did you see him in 48 Hours? No, I haven't seen it yet. So you're doing that? I haven't seen Winds of War yet. I couldn't. Oh, no? Oh, because you were shooting? Working, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if you have a Betamax machine, I videotaped it. You want to welcome to borrow it? Oh, Excellent yeah. movie. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, good. This is uh, broadcast on Manhattan cable uh, television. This reaches Manhattan. Are you rolling your eye? Right, so now uptown. Oh, yeah? I think uh, that lamp's too high, do you? You get some of this? No. No, you don't. You don't. Okay, fine. Right, you know what? We're, I'll tape it for you, and you can take a look at no, it. No, no, no. I'll take your word for it. I can't make you look as good as uh, Mr. Painter does, but... I haven't seen... Uh, and you, you don't go to the dailies? No. I can't stand to look at myself in the dailies. <laughs> I don't think any actor should go to the dailies either. You, you might see something if you've done it and it's good, let it alone. And uh, uh, I don't know, I, I could never be satisfied with myself and I would think no actor would. In, in the, the dailies, the directors You'd be un unhappy about what you're doing. It's yeah. better to stay away from it. Well, don't, don't a, lot, a lot of the good directors don't they they say stay away or they 
No, no, nobody's said it to me because I've not since the very early 30s have I uh, been to the rushes. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, your job. What, uh, what appealed to you about Trading Places? Hmm? What appealed to you about Trading Places, the script? Uh, well, the first thing was, before I read it, uh, to work with John about whom I'd heard. And uh, the rest of it was the script. When I read the script, it's just, it's such an odd, unique uh, story and treatment. And I was so right because uh, John is so inventive. Uh, have you been on the set? Have you ever no, watched him work? No. Well, um, uh, for instance, <laughs> the other day we had a scene, scene 15. It says, the Dukes brothers, that's uh, Don Amici and me, uh, come out of their house, go down the steps and enter a car. About two lines. It took us all day. He started upstairs in the house in a mansion out on Long Island and he had um, a, a stairway uh, came down uh, from two sides and we came down in step where we were met by two butlers who gave us a coat and a scarf and we separated and this was all sort of mathematical. Uh, down to the uh, uh, lower floor, the ground floor, uh, left and a string of servants were lined up, the women on one side, housemaids and upstairs maids and all that business and butlers and on the other side we were handed our hats and our gloves and finally got in our car. It took us all day to shoot this thing in the script. It was two lines. It was like, uh, I guess, uh, when they shot Ben-Hur and it said, and they have a chariot race, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he's Land Landis is very, very good at visual Inventive. comedy. Inventive. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wonderful. In your autobiography, you mentioned that uh, the, the role of Franklin Delano Roosevelt was your favorite role. And you played Roosevelt on stage, you played him on screen in Sunrise at Campobello, and then recently we saw you playing him again in The Winds of War. I was curious as to, you know, how you kind of, st how you stepped back into that role after, after? Well, it wasn't that easy. Actually, I've been offered, I guess, every FDR part since uh, Sunrise at Campobello, and I've turned them all down. I turned this one down because I didn't want to repeat myself. But after thinking about it and discussing it at great length, I realized that the gap, that the time gap between the end of uh, sunrise at Campobello and the beginning of his appearance in uh, uh, Winds of War, some 20 odd years, everything had happened to this man, intellectually, emotionally, politically, every other way, physically. So that it was, he was almost another character. He was older, it was just before he died. Uh, that peculiar eye thing had, had uh, magnified itself and uh, uh, he was not another man, but uh, a man to whom so many things had happened that it made it a challenge not to play him like uh, he was uh, in uh, Sunrise at Campobello, to play the older man, uh, having gone through all these uh, uh, changes and experiences. I hope it came off. I haven't seen it yet. Your, your theatrical training, uh, you had your own stock company and you did dozens of, pl of plays and it, what a wonderful training ground for an actor. Uh, it's too bad that uh, the young people can't have today what everybody my age and background had, the um, a stock company which most people don't know about today I find. They confuse it with summer stock and they're not remotely uh, alike. Um, if you want to take a second to describe it, um, a group of, say, from 12 to 13, 14 people would come into a town. It was a resident stock company. And at one time, I would say practically every city of 50,000 or over in the United States had at least one resident stock company. And we did another play, did a play each week. And while we were playing one, Beginning at 10 o'clock in the morning every day, we would be rehearsing 
next week's play. So you were learning one, rehearsing one, and playing one all the time. Um, then there were the repertory companies, traveling repertory companies, and there were many of them. Some of them were under tent, and uh, I started out, my first professional job was in Chautauqua, and, and people don't know about Chautauqua today. Upstate New York? I beg pardon? Is it upstate New York? Uh, no, no. Oh, the form Chautauqua of is up on Chautauqua Lake, but <clears throat> um, its background, of course, is a Methodist, I believe, a, a summer conference uh, meeting grounds. And they began to have entertainment, and uh, the entertainment grew, and uh, various producers around the country uh, took it up, and uh, under the auspices of Chautauqua, uh, sent plays out, one night stands with plays and lectures, and uh, there were various circuits. Um, from uh, four day, which was the one I was on, uh, that is four days programming, to a week, and I think they had one that uh, went longer than that. And um, But the play part of it, actually, we did uh, Harold Bell Wright's The Shepherd of the Hills, and uh, I turned 18 on the job. I was the leading man's father. He was 15 years older than I, which meant I had to use a lot of uh, makeup and wigs and things. And I doubled um, the heavy, Wash Gibbs, who has a fight at the mill at the end of the second or third act. I think it was a four-act play, which meant first I had to put on a, a gray wig and uh, makeup and a beard and uh, take it off for the second or third act, whichever uh, Wash Gibbs appeared in, and put on a, a black stocking over here, black mustache, black sideburns, and other makeup for the heavy, and take that off and put the wig and the beard on for the last act. And uh, well, I don't know why I went that far with it, but. Uh, there was all this kind of background for young actors in those days, and uh, you started out uh, sweeping the stage, putting posters on trees, uh, distributing programs, anything, collecting furniture, so that you had a good uh, practical stage background. The young people today can't get it, so it, it's not their fault. Yeah. They'd love to have it. Well, even, even when you went to Hollywood, I, I was amazed and I was looking at in your first four years in pictures, you did 30 movies. You did ele you had 10, 11 picture parts a year. Yeah, well. Unheard of today. <laughs> I was in uh, three at once at one time under contract to Harry Cohn at Columbia. And uh, this was before the Screen Actors Guild. <laughs> and uh, uh, we worked seven days a week, six days anyway, and sometimes seven, and sometimes shoot all night Saturday night until the leading lady fainted Sunday noon or something. <laughs> of course, even in those first, uh, your first couple of years in Hollywood, you, you worked with some of the great directors, uh, like John Ford and Airmail, very exciting picture. Yeah. He was, he was a real tough man, wasn't he? Was he a tough guy? Tough guy? Ford? No, he had a kind of a gruff, uh, what, facade, but uh, he really was a sentimental guy. Uh, he was great to work with, particularly for men. He, uh, in most of his pictures, the men are down on the foreground at each other or something other, and the women are all standing in the background watching, usually with a Madonna-like veil over their heads or something. Oh, I've, I've uh, exaggerated this, but he was great for men and uh, great to work with. Do you remember uh, uh, Raul, Raul Walsh? Uh, Raul Walsh, uh, sure. You did, you did a wild girl for him, which was Salome Jane's Kiss. Yeah. Old, uh, is it true that, that he used to turn his back on a take and listen? listen? I have heard that. I never saw him do it. Uh -huh. But uh, I have heard this, and I've heard it repeatedly, so I, I imagine there's some truth to it. What do you, what do you he remember? He was an a interesting one to work with. He. Uh, he knew what he wanted, and he knew when he got it. 
as opposed to some people in those days who had many, many takes of a scene and sometimes you didn't know why you were doing it over again. Even if you'd ask, what, what can I change, make a suggestion. Uh, a director might say, uh, well, I just think we might get a better one, try it again. And maybe they were right, I don't know. But uh, How about uh, working with Frank Capra before he had that the big string of, of uh, hits, I guess when Columbia was still considered poverty trying low. Trying to become a major studio, yes. Uh, yeah, I did a picture called uh, um, Forbidden with him with Barbara Stanwyck and uh, Adolf Monjou. Actually, it was a, a steal on Back Street. There had been a lot of talk about Back Street, which uh, I think John Stahl made at uh, Universal with Irene Dunn and um, uh, I forgot. Oh, uh, anyway, yeah. John Bowles, yeah. John Bowles, that's right. And uh, Harry Cohn got the idea that uh, <laughs> we might beat them to it. So they, uh, some pretty good writers too. Um, um, oh, uh, Joe Swirling. Oh, uh, uh, Joe, Joe Swirling, Everett. Uh, uh, Riskin. Brisk, uh, uh, Riskin. Uh -huh. Riskin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Everett Riskin. Harry Cohn had quite a. Uh, a roster of writers there who helped him uh, uh, make become a major studio. When I first went there under contract, the back lot was uh, mud when it rained. They had to put boards down to get to the stages. Hey, you got along with Harry Cohn pretty well, from from what you said. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, uh, in a kind of a way liked Harry Cohn. We used to go to the football games together and things and. Um, a lot of people didn't. They didn't understand him. He had, again, a very gruff exterior. And I quickly found out that if you gave back as good as he gave you, he'd laugh at you. I had a couple of experiences with him that might be amusing. This was before the Screen Actors Guild. Incidentally, I was one of the founders of the Screen Actors Guild and on the first board. Um, I say we worked every day. And I was in three pictures at once while I was there under contract to him. And uh, some of my friends had just arbitrarily been quitting work at six o'clock, which seemed to make sense to me. And I thought, if anybody has a right to do this, I have. So I would tell the uh, assistant director uh, at five o'clock or so uh, that I'd be going at six o'clock. So. Uh, don't let the director get into a setup that includes me because I won't be here after six o'clock. And this went on for a while and Harry Cohn sent for me. And uh, in language that uh, you can't use under these present circumstances, he said, what is this walking off a set, you New York actors? Who do you think you are? And I said, well, uh, Harry, uh, I'm in almost every picture you make, and I, I work almost every day of the year here, and I just can't do it. And he said, you're under contract to me, you'll do what I tell you, in words a little stronger than that. So I said, all right, if that's the case, let's tear up the contract, because I can't do it. Well, we walked around with this for a while, and he said, finally, smiled, and he said, all right, you can quit at six o'clock on one condition. Don't tell Jack Holt. Jack Holt was there doing the same thing I was working. I never met him. He, we, we didn't have time to meet. He was in a picture a week, practically. Then uh, time went on, and uh, again, I was in too many pictures, and I s said uh, to Harry, I have to have a stand-in. He said, a stand-in? We never had a stand-in on the Columbia lot, and we never will have. And I said, well, I'll have to have one, or again, I won't be able to work. It's just uh, standing in to be lighted and, and then do the scene. You've, uh, your energy's been sapped standing on, under those hot lights, and they were much hotter then than they are today. And again, we fought it around in the same way as we did about uh, the 6 o'clock thing. And finally, he said, all right, you're going to have a stand-in on one condition. Don't tell Jack Holt. <laughs> Your, your, your first picture with, with Tay Garnett, uh, Destination Unknown, kind of yeah. interesting picture. You played like a Christ-like figure who comes on the boat. Well, it was a parable on the, the uh, uh, turning the wine into water. Um, 
It was under dreadful circumstances. The, the Hollywood was in the midst of a flu epidemic, the like of which has never been known, I guess since the bad one in Chicago, which I went through uh, many years earlier. Um, every studio in town was closed except Universal, where we were making Destination Unknown. And uh, there was a ship, the whole story was, was laid aboard a ship, and finally a wreck, the ship was wrecked. So we'd uh, come to work and uh, climb up on this ship, which was mounted up in the air on, uh, so it could rock and roll uh, as if at sea. And we had, we'd have fire hoses turned on us. It was in the middle of a flu epidemic. And uh, work all day in the water. And uh, I don't know, there's not much, uh, it isn't much of a story except to describe that part of it. We, uh, we ended up in a, a tank uh, we were when we were shipwrecked, and then the final shots uh, down in the ocean, and uh, we all came through it. I must say, uh, I guess in all honesty, uh, during the day, every once in a while, we would nip a little bit. Uh, during the shooting of it, um, this was in the days of Uncle Carl Lemley, who ran Universal, and they sent for Tay. Uh, during the daytime one day and they said uh, how is it that you can go on making this picture in the midst, midst of this flu epidemic and with every other studio shut down and you're the only company working on the lot and all that water and Tay said well we drink a little bit <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned that he, he had his trademark cane. You called it a goosing cane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was a character. He was a great practical joker. A uh, great fellow to work with. Always uh, something amusing going on, which um, transmitted itself to the company, and the company was always a happy company. In your other picture with him, uh, Trade Wins, Trade ones with Freddie March, yeah. and, and you were, you played just, just just about the whole picture in, in, in front of the process screen with uh, the footage. Uh, of Tay was married uh, at that time to uh, Patsy Ruth Miller, and they went around the world on their yacht, their own yacht, and he shot background plates. I don't know if anybody, or if everybody understands about background plate. Shall I try to describe what it is? The rear projection? It's a, yeah, uh, a, an enormous um, transparent transparency, maybe uh, 20 feet square. Uh, a camera in back of it um, projected a picture and the action uh, the uh, the actors performed in front so that it looked as if you were in the area that was being projected uh, from the rear of the screen is that is that clear enough and you did the well, whole picture they, he shot these uh, they shot these uh, background plates around the world and uh, then wrote a story about uh, people going around the world i, I was a crazy detective in that. Freddie March and uh, Johnny Bennett were the uh, romantic interest. You, you did that at the United Artists? Was that at the Wanger? United Artists, yeah. Mm -hmm. Walter Wanger. Another very interesting part for you uh, uh, during that time was uh, in Hands Across the Table, in which you played... Carol Lombard. Uh, you played the whole part. Mitch Lice and Fred McMurray at yeah. Paramount. Yeah. You, you played the whole picture in the wheelchair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it was a very light comedy role. Yeah, yeah. It was a nice one, nice experience. And Carol was a great girl, great girl, and great to work with. Uh, that wasn't her name. Her name was, I think, Jane Peters. Yeah, yeah. And she... Uh, got her name, it's interesting, was to me, uh, figured it out with numerology. Hmm. And it worked for her for a while. <laughs> How is uh, Mitchell Lison? He seems to be underrated, overlooked uh, these days. Meticulous director. He uh, had a great um, artistic sense and a very <laughs> sensitive guy. Lovely to work with. Gee, I loved your part in, in The Wedding Night. He played crazy. Gary Cooper and Anna Stan. Yeah, yeah. he played Frederick, the 
jealous the jealous lover. The King Vito directed, yeah. Did he did Vito um did, did he really did he discuss motivation like more than, than some of the others? Did he what? Did he discuss your motivation more than the others, maybe? Oh maybe. Um perhaps because uh Anna Sten had just come over and um if you remember, she had a little accent and uh, was kind of all new to her. She demanded that the set be enclosed in uh, um, backings so that only the working company, the people who had to be present, cast and crew, were inside this enclosure, uh, which was really kind of silly in a way because uh, those who wanted to see poked a hole in the canvas. <laughs> <laughs> wall that surrounded her, but um, um, yes, he talked, and, and as I remember, he was a wonderful man, great director and a wonderful man, just died. Um, his discussion was to the entire cast rather than to one person, or rather than, than talking to one person about the performance of his or her part. It was he'd, he'd talk the scene uh, over the, and with relation to the whole story, and uh, <clears throat> a delightful man. Gary Cooper had, had they always said that he, when you watched him act on the set, he uh, he couldn't really tell what was going on. But then when you saw him on the screen, there was this marvelous thing, go, acting presence going on there. Yeah, yeah, that's what he had more than anything—a presence. Uh, he knew it too. <clears throat> One time we were working together at uh, Warner Brothers on something. Oh, the uh, court martial of Billy Mitchell, I think it was. Anyway, we were walking back from the set one day, having finished work, <coughs> uh, to, the, to our dressing rooms, and uh, he said, um, you know, this is a crazy thing that's happened to me. He said, I've been in the top ten for the last 12 years or something, and he said, I don't know what I'm doing up there, but uh, <laughs> as long as they want to uh, photograph me and pay me, I'll do it. <laughs> but he was great. I loved uh, to watch Gary on the, on the screen. Um, this, this strong, uh, macho sort of uh, uh, strong uh, personality. Uh, came out at you from the screen. And another lovely guy, too. You know, uh, a couple of the, of the directors that you worked with were very uh, into the imp improvisation, like uh, LaCava, Gregory LaCava. Oh, that was unfortunate. Well, uh, I like Greg. Um, I did a picture with Leo McCary, The Awful Truth. Uh, I don't know how much time you have here. Can as much as you time story? as you have, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was at, under contract to Harry Cohn, and uh, the studio manager called me and he said, Mr. Cohn is sending over you to you a script by motorcycle of the awful truth. He wants you to read it, and um, uh, for the part of the Englishman, but it's not going to be an Englishman. I said, well, well why should I read it? And he said, I don't know, that's what Mr. Cohn told me. So the script came over, and as you probably know, it was taken from a stage play, and the part of the Englishman, which had been played on the stage by Roland Young, was a very, very amusing.